There were some eye-opening stats that came out this week. I'm sure that you, you saw them, or I would assume uh, that maybe a few of you did, uh, from Ligonier and their state of theology. Uh, let me go ahead and give a few of these to you. Among evangelicals, and again, this is not America as a whole, this is just those who claim to be a part of Orthodox Bible teaching churches around the country. Uh, here were a few of the numbers. Among evangelicals, 56% affirm uh, that God accepts the worship of all religions. 43% of evangelicals now affirm that Jesus was only a great teacher. 38% of evangelicals acknowledged or stated that religious belief is a personal opinion and not objective truth. And 37% say that gender identity is a matter of choice. And 28% of evangelicals now say that biblical commands against homosexuality don't apply to uh, the modern world or the modern church. <clears throat> Uh, Oprah asked Carl Lentz on television a, a few years ago if God rejects non-Christians. Uh, Lentz responded, quote, No, God won't reject them. God loves so much whether they accept or reject Him, He is still gracious, end quote. Uh, Oprah asked T.D. Jakes, if homosexuality is wrong, Jake's responded, quote, well, well not, it's not for me to say. Their community just needs to find a house of worship to suit their needs, end quote. Larry King asked Joel Osteen if Muslims are going to go to heaven. Osteen responded, well, I'm, I'm, I'm very careful about saying who goes to to heaven or who goes to hell. See, I've been in India and they're Muslims and they don't know Jesus, but they, they sure do love a lot, end quote. Lauren Daigle was asked if homosexuality is wrong on a podcast recently and she said, well, it's not for me to say. They all should just go read the Bible and then they can let me know when they find out, end quote. Of course, Rob Bell, in his infamous video and book, Love Wins, uh, asked the rhetorical question, quote, will only a few be in heaven and millions of others burn? Must you really be born again and know Jesus to be saved? Or is there another way? And then he concludes with the famous line from the book, Love Wins, end quote. I want to finish this series uh, with the subject of consumer Christianity. Uh, I believe this will be the last week of this series. I, I'd really like to get back to 1 Corinthians 7 and talk to the singles and the married people. It's going to be a great chapter. Uh, but if, if for some reason, you know, I, I, I get a different sense of direction, uh, uh, and it, there's another option here in subject, we'll get to it. But I'd like to finish this morning talking about the subject or the topic of consumer Christianity. Uh, you guys all know that's now the norm in America. Now, hopefully you know that. I know many of you have come out of these churches. It is a lukewarm Christianity, a soft-serve Christianity. It's kind of a toe in, in Christianity or a toe with Jesus and then a toe in the world where, where we'll talk the talk on Sunday but not walk the walk on Monday through, through Friday. We'll make a claim to heaven, but then we'll live like hell all week long. And so what I want to do this morning is review a text with you that we studied briefly six to seven months ago, uh, but I want to take you behind the text a little more deeply and in fact pull Analogia Scriptura, all the other scriptures to bear and speak to you this morning about the Lordship of Christ and how there is no such thing as a lukewarm church. There really is no such thing. And so if you have your Bibles, open them with me toward the end of your Bible to 1 John chapter 2. Uh, 1 John chapter 2. Uh, if you're newer with us, you may have missed this particular sermon. If you've been here a while, you'll remember 
Uh, we made a quick journey through 1 John, and really all it is is a series of tests where John wants uh, the, the reader to know if they're saved or not, if they're a part of uh, Christianity and they're a, a member of God's house and family or not, and he's very black and white. Uh, through his series of nine tests. And uh, the fourth one we're going to study this morning is in 1 John chapter 2. And let's read it together in verse 15 through 17. Verse 15 through 17. If you've got a pen, would you pull it out? I'm going to ask you to underline uh, a single word. You'll very quickly pick up what that word is. John begins in this little paragraph in verse 15, and he says, primary command, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but it is from the world. And the world is passing away, and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. So if you've got your pen, go ahead and just underline there in verse 15, don't love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, verse 16, for all that's in the world, at the end of verse 16, but it's from the world, and verse 17, and the world is passing away. Did you get the theme of the paragraph here? We good? It's what? Very good. Very good. Cosmos. The opposite of chaos. Chaos is disorder. Cosmos is a Greek word that refers to order. And that's the theme here. And this is the first big command of the entire epistle, and it's really one of the most important and potent texts in all the New Testament because there's just no, as we'll see this morning, wiggle room. You're either going to be in the world or you're going to be in the faith. There's just no, there's no room to wiggle. Uh, It was back in 1519, a lot of you will remember Hernando Cortez uh, landed from Spain with 700 men and 11 boats on Veracruz here in South America. Uh, And, of course, the story is famous because it was the first time that a European explorer had not only landed there and planted a flag for Spain, but also because Cortez famously made another move. He turned around to all of his men, and then he commanded, do you remember what he did? That all 11 boats be what? Remember the story? That they all be burnt. And so here's his men standing on the beach, and they're looking at the one option to get back home to their family and realizing, well, that's over. So they turned and looked at the jungles of South America and knew we've got one choice. Friends, that is a vivid analogy of what it means to be a true Christian. Where when we're saved, I mean, we're planting the the flag, moving forward for Christ, and then we're burning the boats behind us. I mean, we're literally staring out at what's ahead of us, and we're in love with the Lord, and then we have forgotten the world. We are ready to live for God and to forget the world. It means to burn the old life, if you're truly a Christian. Everything that he says in this word, I will do. And everything that he says to turn from, I'm going to turn from, and that's what it means to be a Christian. So friends, if you've come out of the megachurch ministry, I really want you to hear this this morning. I want you to hear this. The idea of a fly-by-night Christianity, the idea of a, of a come Christmas and an Easter-only Christianity, uh, the idea of a, of a foot-in and foot-out Christianity, the idea of a take-a-verse and then leave-a-verse Christianity, The idea of a sing on Sunday and then party Monday through Friday Christianity, it just doesn't exist in the Bible. The idea that you can come to church and you can put your kids in ministry and throw a few bucks in the offering plate and then go back and live however you want, it just doesn't exist in in Christianity. It doesn't exist in the Bible. You've got to burn the old life. You've got to burn the boats of the old life. So if you've got your pen out, let's begin. We're going to go through a command, we're going to go through a counterfeit, we're going to go through clarity and then a consequence. And in verse 15, you've got that primary command. Go ahead and just look at it again. Verse 15, don't 
love the world. Don't love it. It's pretty clear. The obvious question that pops up is what? Well, what is the world? Cosmos, what does that mean? There's, there's a multiple multitude of ways that John uses it in, in, his, in his literature. Your number one would be pretty well known is, is the physical world, the universe. And, and it's possible um, you know, that, that that could be what he means here, but we don't think so because Psalm chapter 19 says that the creation of God, the physical universe, uh, exalts and glorifies and reflects the glory of God. So he wouldn't be saying don't love what he's made. Number two, oftentimes the word cosmos is used to re- re- reference people or reflect people. Uh, but we know that he would not be telling us to, to turn and to, to hate, not love people, because John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So there's obviously going to be a love for, for people. And so by process of elimination, it's clear that the best option here for a world is what we would call the evil system. John often uses the term cosmos, to refer to the evil system, the evil order, the fallen nature, the spirit of the age. All of the values and the lifestyles, the philosophies and the trickery of the world system. You and I live in that. It's it's what goes into our ears through the narratives. It's what goes into our ears through the ideologies. It's what goes into the ears and the mind through the rationalisms of man that begins to turn us away from worship of the living God. That's the term that he's using here, the world, the evil world system. Uh, we know 1 John 4, 3, that it's loaded with false prophets. John says, every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you've heard is coming and now is already in the world. So anyone who would get up and say, no, Jesus is not God and you don't worship him and he's not the way and he's not the truth and he's not the life, Ultimately, whether they know it or not, they're an anti-Christ, an anti-Christian teacher. And that's the world system. Now, we also know 1 John 5, 19, that the world system is held in Satan's hands. John says, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So that's the world system. The, the machinery, the trickery, the ideology, the narratives that push us ever more away from the truth of Christ. That's the world. And then the next question that comes in verse 15 is, what is love? What does it mean to love the world? Agabao just means a preeminent love, uh, an affection of the will, an unconditional love. You guys probably know that in your own marriage, right? You're supposed to love your wife or husband unconditionally. You may have an erotic love, an eros love, you know, romance. You may have a phileo love, a friendship love. But ultimately, biblically, you want to love your spouse unconditionally. I love you by choice. I'll lay down my life. That's what that term means. It's an affection of the will. It's a choice. Now, we can learn a lot about that. You know, that kind of love recognizes both an affirmation and a denial. It recognizes both. I mean, if you love one, then you're going to hate the other. If you love one, then you're going to hate the enemy of the one that you love. If someone walks up to you, to your wife, and they want to hit her in the face, you're you're going to respond ardently to make sure that doesn't happen because you love your wife. Well, the same is true with Jesus. If you truly love Jesus, you're going to hate anything that's anti-Jesus. And if you truly love the word, then you're going to hate anything that's anti-his word. It's a recognition of an affirmation and a denial. Also, number two, it speaks to a a wholesale rejection of everything that's anti-Christ. It's a complete rejection. Every humanistic ideology, every man-based philosophy, every atheism, every Catholicism, every Mormonism, every Buddhism, every cultism, every mysticism, every Jehovah Witness, and any part of Satan's cosmic rebellion, the true believer is going to go, I despise that. Because it raises its fist against my Savior and against my Lord. Now, it's a hatred of the system, but it's not a hatred of the people. That's important to understand. He's saying if you love Christ, you're you're, you're, going to naturally hate the world system, but he's not saying you hate the people. You hate the people. I mean, that's evident in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. Paul says, For though we walk in the flesh, that's the, the physical side, we don't war according to the flesh. We're not angry. We're not out storming the streets and trying to take down the people who are in rebellion against God. 
For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. And then he explains what those are. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And he's using terminology there that refers to the ideologies and the narratives and the rationalisms, the, the sophist, uh, the belief systems, la gizmas of the world. In fact, we all can picture that now more than ever because of the, the virtual world. Literally above our heads right now, there's a conversation going on. And some of you are supposed to be listening to me, but you're having that conversation because you're on a phone. You know, the reality is, is all around us, there's a virtual realm. And we leave this place and we go and we engage the mind in that, in that battle. That's what he's talking about here, because what goes into the mind begins to make the man or the woman. And Christianity opposes the onslaught of the devil when it, he assaults the mind through the world system. He says, well, what is the world? What is love? How about number three? What are the things he talks about? See, look at it again in verse 15. Don't love the world, nor the things that are in the world. Well, what are the things in the world? It's all the materials of earthly subsistence. Now, it's okay to have a house and a car and a set of golf clubs. Some of you guys like golfing and you're good at golfing. Uh, but your house and your car and your golf clubs can't have you. That's what he's saying. Some of you guys have a nice boat, but your boat can't have you. Some of you guys have nice clothes, but your clothes can't have you. Your affections and your love and the very drive of your life cannot be for the things of the, the world. See, if you're a true Christian, you're going to burn the boats of the old life. You're going to burn them. You're going to burn them. Which leads us to number two. We go from a command here and we jump right into the counterfeit. Look at this in verse 15. And now he's, he's pressing a little bit. He's pressing a little bit by, by a negation. And he says in verse 15, and if anyone does love the world. So friends, if you're here and you're going, you know what, I actually love the world. I, I like partying and I, I like the way the world thinks and I'm, a, I'm more of a, a liberal thinker and I, I really don't believe too much in this idea of God and I, I believe the Bible could partially be wrong and I, I don't really bend my knee fully to the submission to Christ. I'm kind of a come to church on Sunday and sprinkle a little bit of Jesus on the top of my existence. If that's you, verse 15, if anyone, so that's everybody, loves the world. If your heart is for the world and the world system, then the love of the Father is not what? It's not in him. That's one of the most potent verses in the entire Bible. A fork in the road, a watershed. There is zero wiggle. You cannot coexist with the world. You can't do it. I mean, it's possible to be tempted by the world and, and to slip in the world and to even stumble in the world. But true Christians just can't have an ongoing love affair with the world. Let me give you a few verses. You got a pen there? Write these down in the margin. Here we go. Number one, write down Ephesians 2, 1 through 4. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 4. True Christianity is turning from the world master. It's turning from the world master. Paul says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And some of you will remember that. You remember when you were. All you could think about when you woke up was yourself. <laughs> you, you, you woke up and you thought, you know, what am I going to do today? What can I get for me today? You know what I want to do by tonight? I mean, the moment you wake up, you're already planning the culmination of your day with what you're going to do that night. He says, that was all of us. We were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we formerly walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air. But God. Rich in mercy, because of his great love, made us alive together with Christ. He took us out of the world, and then he put us into the kingdom of his son. But we no longer serve that master. And he goes on, I'll give you another one. Galatians 6, verse 14. True Christianity is not only turning from the world master, it's when Christ kills the world's spirit on the inside. Christ comes in and he crucifies that desire for the world. Galatians 6, 14. Paul says, May it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I'm dead to it. I'm dead to it. 
Every time one of those commercials comes on TV, every time a new magazine pops up with an ad, every time you're watching YouTube and they're targeting you with AI, there should be a click in your soul that goes, you're not getting me anymore. I'm not buying in anymore. That's not for me anymore. I've got a new Lord and a new love. True Christianity is turning from a world master. True Christianity is, is killing a world spirit. How about another one? Write this one down. John 17, 14. True Christianity is even incurring world hatred. The, the system will hate you for what you believe. It'll hate you for what you believe. Look what Jesus said in John 17. He said, I have given them, meaning the disciples, your word, and the world has hated them. Why? Why does the world system hate them? Because they are no longer of the what? Of the world. Even as I am not of the world. I mean, who had... 15 years ago, an NOTW sticker. Anybody? Okay, you're all from Corona. <laughs> Remember that? You got a big NOTW sticker on the back of your pickup truck with your six-inch lift and your 34s, Michael Kirkshin. Yeah, wearing your flat bill, 951. Okay, so that was you. You, you. you didn't put them on your Teslas, I saw. I was in the parking lot today. What does NOTW stand for? You remember? Not of what? You put that on your truck. He says, no, you got to put that on your heart. And friends, let me just say this. If you're here and you go, you know, the world's not opposing me, then you have to ask some really, really, really serious questions about what you're standing for. Because Jesus said, the world system will despise you. See, true Christianity is turning from the world master. It's killing the world spirit. It's incurring world hatred. Here's another one. You could write this one down. Matthew 13, verse 22. True Christianity is not being choked out by world wealth by world materials. You remember the story? Jesus says that there were four soils and remember the seed got planted on each one and then he says that there was the, the one where the thorns kind of began to wrap its way around it after a few months and although it looked like it was going to bloom, it actually was, it was destroyed. Matthew chapter 13 verse 22 and the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word and then the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches in the world begin to choke the word. And it's dead. It's a fake Christian. It's a false convert. You see it all the time at church. You know, a guy will come in, he'll be really pumped up, and he'll sit right down here by, by Alex. Yeah, right with Alex. And he'll, uh, he'll come up after service, and he'll be so pumped, and he'll say, Pastor, I just, I just, I just want to live for Jesus. Oh, what do I do? Buy a Bible. What kind? Oh, I'll get a MacArthur study Bible. I'll get a big thick one, 25 pounder. And he'll come in and he's got it against his chest. Right? And then I'll watch him. And he starts moving back. He goes back by Cameron and then by Noah. Pretty soon he's, he's way in the back there by David and eventually by Eber. And then by, he, you know, the, with all the sinners like Dan, you know. He's... <laughs> You guys, we have a relationship on Sunday mornings. You guys may not think you see me and you know a lot about me, but I see you. We have a dialogue. I see your, your, your reactions. I see your eyes. I know how you respond. I know when you're happy. I know when you're mad at me. I know all those things. But I'll, I'll see him and I'll pray and I'll pray. But then one day I'll, he'll, he'll be gone and then I'll see on Instagram he's back out where? He's back out in his old life in the world. See, the thorns come up and they choke you out. True Christianity is turning from the world master. It's killing the world spirit. It's incurring world hatred. It's choking out world wealth. True Christianity, friends, here's another one, is a heavenly win, but it's a worldly loss. It's a world loss. Listen to this, Matthew 16, verse 26. For what will a man be profited, finish it with me, if he gains the whole world and what? Forfeits his, remember that verse? Remember the context of that verse? That's happening all the time, all the time. In these big churches, people come in and they're, they're gaining the world. Meanwhile, they're rubbing a little bit of salve on their soul and they, 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 they're gaining the world, but they're about to lose their soul. True Christianity, it's just I'm sold out for heaven. I don't love this world. See, you can't be a true Christian and love the world. I mean, that'd be like, you know, you go into your girlfriend. Let's say Alex proposes soon. You're, you're going to get a girlfriend soon. It's like you and Jordan and Elijah. You, you know, you're like the bachelors of Mission Bible, right? And <clears throat> one of these days, it's going to be a church-wide event when you get down on one knee. You, you imagine Alex, and he gets down on one knee, right? 
and all these ladies are here. He can sing. He's got a good job. So he gets down on one knee. Now just imagine, Alex gets down on one knee, right? And he, he gets down and he holds up that ring and he says, I love you. And I want to marry you. You, you would sing, I want to marry you. <clears throat> but then imagine she's got all of her, her friends behind her. She's got all her friends behind her and he goes, I want to marry you. And then he looks over at one of the friends. He goes, oh, and, and you. Oh, and, and you. you. Can you? That's what's happening all the time in these churches. Oh, Jesus, yeah, I, 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 want, I want you. Oh, but I also want, I want you. I want you, but I want this. You're going to start hating the world system, and you're going to be fired up about the world system because the world system rejects your Savior, and it's dishonoring and discrediting your Lord. And that's when you know that you're truly saved because you can have no rivals. Jesus will have no rivals. It is an unconditional, complete surrender and submission to everything that he is. And you'll renounce everything else. All your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. I mean, that was the story of Zacchaeus, do you remember? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree because the Lord he wanted to see. Jesus comes to his house and he said, oh, salvation has come to this house. Why? This man broke forth from the door. And what did he say? I will pay back twice of all that I've robbed. He was a transformed man with a new master. And all he cared about was serving that master. And Jesus said, today, true salvation has come to this house. It's not a halfway salvation. It's not a partway salvation. It's a complete transformation of a soul. If you're a true Christian, you're going to burn the boats of what? Your old life. It's gone. See, he moves from the command to the counterfeit, number three. You're ready to the clarity. He brings clarity to it all so you would understand. We'd all understand how the world system works. Look at verse 16. For, for all that is in the world, he kind of lumps it all together. And he says, I'm going to give you the three component pieces of the world system, the, the, the trinity of evil. Here's the core values. Here's how it's going to work to try to pull you out and suck you down. He says, for all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, number one, the lust of the eyes, number two, and the boastful pride of life, number three, is not from the Father, but from the where? It's from the world. That's it. So you got a pen there in your margin. Let's go back through these again. I know we hit them in a few weeks ago or a few months ago, but hit them again. Number one, ready? Lust of the flesh. If you got a pen in your margin there and you got room, just write this in. That, that's referring to an appetite of the senses. An appetite of the senses. The world system exacerbates the appetites. That's what it does. We, of course, saw that with Eve. You remember? Eve. You, know, you can have any tree, Eve. Okay. Every one of these... Oh, except that one. Okay, well, I love all these, but I want what? I want that one. God gave a box and said, this is what I want for you. It's going to satisfy you. It's going to be beautiful for you. But the appetite, the world system presses and wants us to get to break out of that box and to, and to grab things that will be unhealthy and destructive. You know, food is good. Gluttony is sinful. But the world system says, no, just, just keep eating. Sex is good. In the confines of a monogamous marriage between a male and a female, the world system says break out of the box and it becomes ardently, ardently sinful and destructive. Leadership is good. Dominance is bad. See, that's what the appetite, the flesh does. It wants to always break out of the box. It's like a fire in a fireplace and God says keep it in and then the appetite of the flesh wants to push it and the world is always pushing it out of the fireplace and it burns the house down. It turns good things into controlling passions. Uh, how about this one? The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. Everyone knows what that is, right? We, we typically call that coveting or longing. Anybody here ever long for anything? Be honest. Anybody here ever just long for something? Anybody? Like, what, what is it? You ever thought about that? You long for a spouse? 
or a house? See, the lust of the eyes is a longing. It's a coveting. And then the world algorithm, the world system, is constantly putting in front of us things that try to get us to, to not be satisfied and content with what we have all the time. I was on an airplane ride yesterday, San Francisco, with Zeke finishing an event. We came back down, and I pulled out. I was, I was sitting there with him, and he was playing chess, and I, I pulled out one of those magazines. You ever see those magazines on the back of airplanes? And it, it, you open it up, and the whole thing is just showing you all the places that you've never been that you need to go to. And I'm only two minutes in. I'm a minute in. I have this sermon. I just finished prepping a little bit. And I'm reading this magazine, and I'm going, oh, I want to go there. I need to go. You hear the word? I need to go there. Oh, if I could just go there, we're going to have a great... I'm picturing it in my mind. You ever seen those magazines? I don't even know what Longfellow, Colorado is. I don't even know if there's mist that comes off the lake there. I don't even know if there's really a bungalow in Cabo the way that they tell me. I don't know any of that. But in my heart, they're telling me, if you get here, you're going to be relaxed. <laughs> now, 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 we go, well, that's, that's more innocent. But what's pornography? See, from the age of 11 now, or 10, our children are clicking on a single button. And then artificial intelligence drives them via an algorithm the rest of their life deeper and deeper and deeper into sin. For some of you, you may only in your mind believe that the entire World Wide Web is full of e evil, filth, and clutter because from a young age, all you've ever clicked on, and artificial intelligence is putting that in front of you. Every time you pull up your screen, all you ever see in front of you is advertisements for evil because they got your number. They know what you like. I mean, Bree and I were on date night the other night. We're talking about something. I forget what it was. I got home and I clicked on the Instagram. And guess what there was an advertisement for? They were listening. <laughs> That's the world system. It's constantly pulling and, and creating desires and telling you you just don't have enough. It's a lust of the eye. felt that way I pulled in the other day and you guys all have Teslas I got an old GMC terrain and you all got Teslas you ever had longing like that you wanted a Tesla didn't you it's real Number three, the pride of life. You see that? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It's just a natural interest in yourself. We all are our own biggest fan. I guarantee when you woke up this morning, you walked to the mirror, and who'd you think about? Oh, I wonder how Sally's doing. No, we look in the mirror and we go, well, I wonder how I'm looking. And that's really the story of our life. The world system plays on our narcissism. I mean, you remember Lucifer? I'm, I'm happy with being in charge of every other created thing, but you know what? I don't quite have enough. I want your job. Self-promotion. Self-vanity. Self-glory. The pursuit of a platform and of title. And even after you get some money in your life, you guys who have money, you know this, you know, then, you all, then you want power and you want everyone to know about how much money you have. That's why wealthy people are very rarely content because they want everyone to know just what they have. You ever been satisfied in your heart, a little bit of satisfaction when somebody in your life fails? That's a frightening thing. When you see somebody in your life who you, 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 you maybe felt a little bit of envy for and they falter and then you kind of feel like, oh, okay. That's all pride of life. It's all pride of life. Now look at verse 16 again. Where's all that from? Where's it from? Look at it. The end of verse 16. It's not from the Father, but it's from the what? From the world. Every godless ideology 
is it always will fit this schema, this diagnostic. You think about debauchery and partying, it's the lust of the flesh. You think about materialism and workaholism, lust of the flesh. Marxism and socialism and economic equity, that's a lust of the eyes. And humanism and psychology and Darwin evolution, it's a pride of life. Atheism and, and, and rational rule of the, the man is a pride of life. Abortion, my body, my choice, pride of life. Pride parades, inner voice, do what I want, pride of life. It all comes back to the same stuff. Godless ideologies driven from one of these three things. Uh, I was on date night with Bree. You can see we have some really great talks on date night. And uh, we were sitting at a Mexican restaurant. We were watching the tacos being made. And I, I started pontificating. I do that sometimes. It's, I go off and you, you can pray for her. It's tough. This is not good romantic conversation. I got to get better at this. You guys are going to hear this and go, that's what you guys talk about? I'm sitting there and I'm watching these young waiters and waitresses and they're buzzing around. You know how they do. And they're joking with one another and flipping their hair. And I just said, I said to her, I said, honey, if I woke up in the morning and this is all that I had to do was make tacos and flirt and try to hook up with somebody, I would kill myself. She's looking at me like, oh, it's going to be a good date night, right? I said, I said, no, seriously, think about what Satan has done to us. If you don't have God and you don't have eternity and you don't have a reason to live, like, look at what they're doing. And I said, I, I, how do you do that? Well, here's the answer. See, every morning when a person wakes up who doesn't have the Lord, you know, one of three lies is put in front of them. A little more power, a little more money, or a little more sex. And if you're here and you're not saved... The only thing that's driving you to wake up again is one of those three things. You have no other reason to wake up. And if you're not saved, eventually you'll commit suicide or end up in a crazy barn. Because you just heard the truth. You can't come back from that. You, why does Elon Musk want to go to Mars? You ever thought about that? Why? Because he's an intellectual elite. He played the chess game of his life early on and realized because it's godless that he has no other reason to live other than a legacy play that's pride of life. To try to prove like Columbus and Magellan that he's one of the greats and his memorial is going to be bigger than everybody else's. If not, he'd kill himself. See, when smart people finally come to conclude that this is all there is, they have to do everything to gain power, hence Hitler. Or else you submit yourself and bend your knee to the lordship of Christ and to a living God and you live for him and then you have hope. But there's no middle ground, see. Satan is just throwing at you an ever-revolving set of lies to try to wake up in the morning and keep going. It never works. If you're a true Christian, you're going to burn the boats of what? The old life. Finish it with me. We have a command. We've got counterfeit. We've got clarity. Finish it with me. Consequence. Look at this in verse 17. Here we go. He just kind of sums it up with an ultimate conclusion. And the world, there it is again, is passing away. See, that's what Elon Musk is figuring out. The world is passing away. And also it's lust, all those lies that Satan threw at you. But the one who does the will of God abides what? Abides forever. That's why you don't love the system. You don't occupy yourself with the system. It's already fading you may not sense it, it's happening slow, but it's going to burn. Now, some of you may be wondering, well, Tony, what's all this have to do with detox and uh, mega churches and, and helping me heal? And, you know, you know, what, Tony, you yelled at me for 30 minutes, right? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked, okay? Real quick, turn with me to one last passage. Go to Revelation. Back of your Bible, and look at, look at Revelation. You'll love this. Everyone, you've got to look at this. This is important. Revelation chapter 3, and look at verse 14. I want to show you what happens. If you buy into the, the Lauren Daigle, T.D. Jakes, Carl Lentz, Rob Bell version of church, okay? I want to show you here a non-church that calls itself a church, Okay? So it calls itself a church, but it's a non-church. It's a group of professors, but not possessors. They have a toe in Christ and a toe in culture. Christ isn't even inside the church. He's on the outside, and he's knocking, trying to get in. And then watch what he does. He's actually going gonna, gonna to vomit them. He's going to puke them out. Revelation 3, look at verse 14. To the, to the angel, that, that's the word for pastor, right? To the pastor of the church in Laodicea. So John's getting a vision. Jesus says to John, I want to write a letter to this particular church. To the pastor of the church in Laodicea, a very wealthy, wealthy town, like Orange County, he says, I want you to write this. 
Tell them that the amen, the faithful and true witness, that's Jesus, the beginning of the creation of God, that's Jesus, says this. Verse 15. I know your deeds. He says, I've been watching you. That you're neither cold nor hot. When I look at your deeds, you're, you're, you're coming on Sunday, but then you're going to live in your life Monday through Friday. You're the, you, you got a toe in the church and a toe in the world. And I would, that you were cold or hot. Isn't that fascinating? I'd rather you be out in the world partying or catch fire. But because, verse 16, you're lukewarm, you're tepid, you're tap water, and you're neither hot nor cold, I'm going to what? What's it say? I'm going to spit you out. Now he's talking to an entire church here. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth because you say, I am rich and I have become wealthy and I have need of nothing and you do not know this whole time. Think about it in Orange County. I'm rich and I'm wealthy and I depend on my savings account and even in a recession and when the stock market's going down, it's going to be okay because I've got equity in the home and I'm depending on what I have. Let the truth of these words crest their way into the depths of your soul in 2022. This is us. Don't push them off. Don't say it's 2,000 years ago. It's Laodicea. This is the church, he says. I'm rich, you say. I've become wealthy. I don't need anything. And you do not know, look what he says, that you are wretched and you are miserable and you are poor and you are blind and you are naked. He talks about the outside and then he moves it to the inside and he says on the inside you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Friends, some of you know that's true right now. You know that on the inside it's nothing but a ball of sin and selfishness and pride and lust and jealousies and greed and envy and you wake up every single morning and you're driven towards your lust. You know that's you. And Jesus says as a church, as a whole, he says you can't come in here on Sundays and go, well, we've got it together. We're in Orange County and God's building more buildings and we're going to get there and on the inside be nothing but a wretch. Look at verse 18. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich in white garments, that you may clothe yourself. He says, I want you to purify. I want you to put on white, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and I salve to anoint your eyes, that you may actually see what matters. Brothers and sisters, listen, please. If this place, us, gets worldly, toe in and toe out, take a bit of scripture and leave out the rest like Jake's and Lentz and Deggle and Bell? We capitulate, we vacillate. Joel Osteen, you, you can stamp whatever name you want on that building. You can put up as many websites as you want. We can run as many programs, millions of them as we want, but this is not a church. And Jesus says, you are miserable, you are poor, you are wretched, and I'm going to puke you out of my mouth. He says, you get out of my sight. Your lampstand is gone. So let me ask you have, you, have you burnt the boats of your old life? I mean all the way. No, no, no secrets. No sin left unconfessed. No lies. 100% all in commitment to Christ. Christ always, Christ ever, unapologetic, unadulterated. Your entire life exists for Christ. Have you burnt the boats on the old life?
Help me out here, church. Is Jesus Lord? Do you recognize him as Lord? Have you bent your knee to him as Lord? Is your entire life in service of the great Lord? Yes or no? Okay. Then the lampstand continues to burn. We continue to be a church. And Jesus Christ is glorified as his bride is beautified.